Hello everyone, how's it going? Dr. Incompetent here, and let's play some Xenonauts 2, shall we? Doing a complete beginner's guide to the game in early access. It just came out in early access today. I've played it in alpha, and now we're going to work on it in early access as the game finishes most of its thrust, and I think that it's around I think 65% of the campaign is done at this point so we can really learn to play the game and learn the basics and the fundamentals and also make a determination on you know is this a game that we want to get how can we be successful because it's a very very difficult game Xenonauts 2 is uh, at least to me a spiritual successor to the classic XCOM games and it's not like um, the contemporary XCOM reboots that are 3D, this is a, a 2D game, very, very similar to the original XCOM, and yet with some modern sensibilities and some really cool plot twists that make this game uh, very strategic and fun, but also punishing. So what I'm going to do is present a complete beginner's guide where we start a new game we play together you can play along with me or you can see the gameplay to help you understand it and I'm going to just explain the controls the UI some basic strategy things I've learned about the game things I've been told by other knowledgeable people about this game from either Xenonauts 1 or 2 now I didn't play Xenonauts 1 and it does tell you in the guide that this is a standalone game it's absolutely not required at all to have played the first games and some things have been changed for this sequel so bear that in mind and I'm not going to tell you how to min-max, give you the optimal loadout for your troops, tell you exactly the fastest way to get zero casualties and dominate the game or anything like that. But rather, I'm just going to kind of show you how to play and explain what's going on in the game so that you can make decisions and run the team that you want to run and play Xenonauts however you want because it really uh, gives you a lot of options and depth once you get into it. But let me tell you, uh, it can be quite challenging. So let's start a new game right here. Now, when you click New Campaign, you're going to get a few options. You can go Recruit Mode for difficulty. You can do Soldier Mode, and it says... Um, intended for players familiar with XCOM, okay? It's a challenging experience that should not feel unfair, and you can do veteran, and this is unforgiving, and then there's harder than, you know, commander, which is like ultimate difficulty. So you can choose between recruit and soldier. I'm going to use soldier for this guide series because it's the default setting. I am familiar with XCOM, and I want to show how to play when it is challenging. However, if you feel that the game is too oppressive, I don't think there's any problem with just going to recruit if you've never played XCOM or Xenonauts. Now, uh, you can kind of give yourself uh, a campaign name. And I'm going to call this in Incompetent Tutorial to start us out. And then we have some other things that we can check with. Now, this, these boxes over here on the right, starting fun, starting panic, I'm not going to change any of these. These are par basically programmed by the soldier mode, but you can adjust things uh, if you want. I'm going to keep everything as is. I'm not going to go Iron Man mode, which means you can't load saves. Um, and I'm going to play the introduction, which is the tutorial mission, with you because I think it's very useful to go through this as a new player to the game to learn the controls and I can also add some information to uh, the tutorial to kind of make you know, provide context and help it make more sense. So this is what we're going to go with and let's start it up. The year is 2009. The world teeters on the brink of nuclear war. Tensions between capitalist and communist nations are at boiling point. Every opportunity for peace has failed, as if an invisible hand inexorably steers humanity towards annihilation. We Xenonauts know the truth. The dark forces poisoning our politics are not human in origin, and we must protect our planet against this extraterrestrial threat however we can. After years spent gathering information on an enemy that few believe exist, we are finally ready to strike back. 
The war for our future begins now. Welcome to Xenonauts 2. In Xenonauts 2, you control a secret organization attempting to protect the world from alien invasion. This short tutorial will explain the basic controls and the events leading up to the start of the campaign. Okay, so right away it's important to note that, you know, if you're familiar with XCOM, in those games, you are part of this organization that is in the spotlight, that everyone knows about you. All the governments know about you, people rally behind you, at least in the first game. Um, even in the second game, although more in a rebellious way, uh, against the, you know, oppressing advent. But in this game, aliens are being kept secret by some organization called the Cleaners. And so there is us, there's the aliens, and then there's also this third party that you're not really sure about what's going on either, uh, that's trying to, you know, keep the idea of an alien invasion hidden from the public. So we are too operating from the shadows. So now they're gonna explain how to use tooltips in the game. And this is one of the game's real strengths, which is that so much of the information is made transparent to you if you know how to find it. So the game features nested tooltips that allow players to access further information where desired. Anywhere that you see a text link, you can hover over it to open an additional tooltip like we just did. So now we have opened up this nested tooltip and they themselves can contain links which spawn further nested tooltips. However, as tooltips disappear when you move your mouse, you must lock them in place before you can do this. You can lock a tooltip by pressing middle mouse button or simply by waiting three seconds. And there is a progress circle that you can see in the upper right of a tooltip when it's loading and going to lock into place. So for example, if I click on this, you'll see in the upper right, now it's locked in place. Well done, you've mastered nested tooltips, lock this tooltip and press the button below to proceed. All right, so we locked it, and now we can just proceed. This is very similar to like if you've ever played Crusader Kings or any of the more modern games that just have so much information that they want to give you and you need nested tooltips. My work on our radar array is now complete, says the chief scientist. Theoretically, we should now be capable of tracking any alien UFOs passing within radar range of this facility. Thank God, says the operations director. It's not exactly been easy to borrow all the things you've been asking for. Hardly my concern. We must achieve the impossible if we are to triumph over the extraterrestrials. Yes, very inspirational. So what's the plan now? We wait. An alien craft should pass within range in the next few days. And honestly, this is what you're doing in this game. It's very similar to XCOM. You know, it's not like they say, hey, go here, you have a quest right here. You're just kind of lying back and seeing if any enemies appear within your radar range, um, UFOs or cleaner activity that you find out about. So you're kind of just on your heels waiting while you research, uh, build your base, and develop tools and vehicles in engineering. At that point, the commander takes over. That's us, the commander. All right, so radar range. The blue circle around your base indicates the radar range of that facility. All right, so now they're telling you about the game speed. So the game is never really paused. It's just at the slowest speed right here, which is F1. And you can toggle between different speeds using these buttons or F1, 2, 3, and 4. These buttons control the flow of time on the geoscape. Time's currently passing at the slowest speed, but as nothing is happening, we should speed it up. So let's take a look at the UI before we uh, progress with this. In the upper left, you'll see there's a settings button. Um, you'll see what day it is. You'll see the time. You'll see right now also how much money we have. And then on the bottom, these green numbers, this is the bottom center of the HUD, these represent the, pat the panic level of different regions on the map. And then uh, this is a kind of text log of events that will populate when things actually happen. Here's our base, central base, the blue is the radar, and then we're on the geoscape, but we can go into our base, we can go to research, we can go to engineering. Research is 
uh, absolutely vital to XCOM-based games where we're going to learn new technology, we're going to need to research the alien artifacts and things, the corpses that we find to develop more weapons, armor vehicles for us. Uh, engineering is where we make those things. Soldiers is where we can see our team. And in this game, leveling up, medals, promotions, these things happen automatically. So it's not like you allocate uh, and you need to, you know, promote people manually or anything like that in this game. This is just where you can manage your troops, change their loadout, their equipment, just see how people are doing, look at their stats, see their hit points, things like that. Uh, this is what you have in your inventory of your base. This shows the armory where you can go again to your soldiers and change the weapons and their loadout. This shows your aircraft that you have, your interceptors and your transport. And then this is your archive screen where you can get further information. Now this stuff over here, launching aircraft, constructing new base and your funding report, we might get to that later, but we're not going to be building a base anytime soon. And really launching aircraft is something that uh, I do personally as a reaction to a UFO. And you can click on it or click on some place you want to go to do that as well. But there are multiple paths for doing things in the game. So I'm just going to speed it all the way up. And you can see the sinusoid of the day and night cycle as the sun passes over the planet. And it says geoscape anomalies. The two anomalies on the map signify hostile action that has raised local panic. They're not interactive, but may indicate the presence of a possibly hidden problem in the affected region. At the start of the game, these are usually caused by cleaner activity. However, UFOs will also generate anomalies as they fly around the map. So what happens is, right here, a politician or politicians have been assassinated. And over here, a journalist was arrested. Now you suppose this is done by the cleaners who are trying to kind of cover up what's going on, but because we don't have influence in that area, we don't have enough information, it just is telling you that something has happened that has raised the panic. So you could see in North America and in the Soviet Union, um, the panic level has gone up from 25 to 26 because of these events. You could see right down here in the bottom center of the HUD, these events have been logged for us to do, but as they say, we can't really do anything. We just know that that's there and it can help provide a clue if we're interested in exploring the region or building a base over there to help stop something that we might think is emerging. So we'll just say proceed. And then now we've detected a UFO and you can only detect a UFO where you have radar. It's a small UFO. It's got no escort. It's going 1800 kilometers per hour. It's high altitude and it's moving west. So what you can do is you can slow time and center on it to look at it on the map, or you can do what they want us to do right now, which is just shoot it down with our interceptors. So if we shoot it down, it will um, prevent it from causing panic in the region and may spawn a crash site. So at the crash site, what happens is um, we're able to basically send a team to investigate the wreckage salvage any resources materials that we find and learn more about the aliens but usually we'll have to fight aliens at the site so we're going to go ahead and click launch interceptors and we have two interceptors to start angel one and two and they're both identical they're equipped at the same thing they're located at central base and it's going to take them you could see eta two minutes and 37 seconds to get to the location they have full armor health and fuel and they're both ready to go so you can launch three aircraft in a squadron, but we only have two at the moment. And they've been selected automatically, so we're just going to say launch aircraft. And then they, boom, they got there really fast because we were they were very close by. So here's the UFO. Now here's your choices when you find a UFO. Your interceptors have reached the UFO and are ready to initiate air combat. In the final game... Uh, this tutorial will explain the basics of air combat, but that part of the game is currently relatively unpolished, so we'll auto-resolve the battle. Now, when you get into the actual campaign, I did this on stream last night, you can actually do manual combat, but they're going to graphically overhaul that through the early access part of the development, so it's going to take a little bit, um, but I was getting some great information by a friend of the channel who was explaining that if you do manual attack, you can actually maneuver your interceptors 
in an intelligent way to help them take less damage and shoot down the UFOs more reliably. But for right now, it's the tutorial, we're just going to go to auto resolve the attack. So if we click this, um, it will just automatically resolve this for us. And basically what happens is they give you a breakdown and it says this is what happened. Your ships got damaged by this much. We used this many rounds of ammunition. Uh, we used, you know, our missiles. Our fuel goes down to here. And then you can say um, you can either accept it and move on. Or you could be like, I hate this. I'm going to do this manually if you want. So it's up to you which you want to do. But for the tutorial, we're just going to accept this result. Then it launches a tactical mission, which is where we're going to send troops to a crash site. So a tactical mission is any battle where your soldiers engage hostile forces in turn-based combat. UFO crash sites are a common type of tactical mission that allow you to capture alien technology for your research efforts. Press the launch combat team button to launch a dropship towards the mission. So we're going to go ahead and click launch combat team. Now from here, just like in XCOM, we've got the Skyhawk. You can see how many, um, you can see its armor level, its hit points, its fuel level by mousing over these icons. You can see how many soldiers are on board. You can see it's right here. It's going to take 29 minutes uh, approximately to get there. And we're just going to go ahead and say launch aircraft. Now, before you do this in the actual game, we'll go through this, but you want to make sure your Skyhawk is loaded with the personnel that you want before you click launch. So you can determine who's on board and then you can adjust their loadouts and stuff, uh, their weapons and things before you get there. So we say launch aircraft and they take us to this screen right here, which lets us adjust their equipment. But at the same time, we might want to change like who is actually on the ship and you need to do that at your base, uh, I do believe. All right, so now they want us to change the soldiers and equipment on board uh, but they're going to say we're just going to keep this full ship of nine soldiers ready to go with their loadouts not affect anything and just launch the drop ship because this is the tutorial that sounds ominous it is every cleaner cell in the region is deploying tactical teams no prizes for guessing where they're headed time for us to leave so you have like a limited time often to get to a crash site and salvage things and secure the situation before the cleaners get there and erase any evidence that the aliens were there at all. Wonderful. Just what my research efforts needed. I suggest you recall your soldiers, Commander. We need to hold the perimeter until everyone can get away. Indeed. Try not to get killed. You seem less mediocre than your predecessor. Thanks, Chief Scientist. Yeah, good luck, Commander. We're counting on you. Thanks, Operations Director. All right. Camera controls. The camera in the tactical combat can be controlled in several ways. So you can use WASD to move the camera around, or you can kind of drag your mouse to the edge. You can also rotate using Q and E, which is very important for seeing things around corners. So you can just rotate the camera like this, or you can use these buttons on the upper left of the heads up display. And now they're telling us that you can change the height using this mouse scroll wheel or the UI buttons to the top left. So these up and down, you can click on this to look up and down. You know, you can see these satellite dishes now that we've moved up. Or you could scroll the mouse wheel down to the bottom uh, to get out of this. Here we go to the bottom floor. Now they're talking about time units. Each unit in tactical combat uses time units to perform actions. These are refreshed each turn and are shared between all types of actions. For example, a soldier that spends all their time units on movement would be unable to fire their weapons. So this, every tactical game does this differently. Some games separate movement points and action points. This game does not. This game says you have a certain number of time units. Now you can see right here on the bottom of the HUD, this is the character panel for who we currently have selected. This is Corporal Peter Ivanov, and he's got 60 time units. These time units um, are in green with the stopwatch icon. That's his full amount of time units. He has zero armor, 50 hit points, and 100 morale. 
and you can see the other actions uh, here like you can crouch you can focus your mind to get some morale and every action that you can do here displays in green the amount of action points that it will take i can take a snapshot with my gun i can take a more you know uh, aim oriented shot i can um really really aim or i can fire burst and these take an increasing amount of time units for whatever action i'm doing with my gun i can even throw my grenade my smoke grenade but it takes 30 time units as you can see and i can use my medical kit and it costs 25 time units to use a med kit on either myself or an adjacent ally but right now we're just going to proceed this and it says the number of time units that a soldier has remaining is the green bar and we have 60. then this is us the commander here they come form up and hold the loading bay all right so the bad guys are coming movement you can plan a movement path for a soldier by left clicking anywhere on the battlefield click the glowing tile to plan a movement path to that location so if i left click this the number at the end of the movement path shows how many time units the soldier will have remaining if they move to that action left click it again in order to tell your soldier to make that move so what's really cool about this game is you can plan and say okay if i move here it's going to take 40 of my 60 and i'll have 20 time units remaining and then you can like click other places i can't right now because the tutorial only wants me to move here but it helps you understand where you can move and how long it's going to take you to do that so you can really really understand precisely where to move and you keep in mind okay well if i have 20 time units left then the only shot that i can take is this ballistic rifle snapshot because it takes 14. i can't for example take a normal shot because it takes 21 if i move there however moving here does provide me with cover and i'll show you in a moment let's click over here rotation you can rotate a soldier without moving them by right clicking anywhere on the battlefield it costs one time unit for every 45 degrees of rotation performed rotate the soldier in the highlighted direction to proceed so this is very important in this game which is that this soldier can only see in their line of sight which is indicated by the tiles that are lit up all of these tiles that are kind of shaded this person can't see them but if i right click over here to where this highlighted tile is this yellow tile you'll see that my soldier will actually turn and then their cone of vision adjusts so I can't see over here anymore but I can now see like all of these doors and they're saying finally we should order this unit to crouch this makes the soldier harder to hit it cost four time units to crouch but it also cost four time units to uncrouch so press the crouch button below to proceed now if you crouch um standing soldiers behind that soldier can fire over you without hitting you so it's helpful for stacking your soldiers in formation uh, but it also provides you with cover and i believe that it provides you with an accuracy a slight accuracy bonus if you are crouched so i tend to crouch all the time if i have the time units available so i'm going to push c and crouch this guy so now he's like really really behind cover he should be very hard to hit but he's also able to take a shot if he sees something and let me explain that in this game you don't click overwatch like you would in XCOM to tell your person okay stand here and fire at anything that comes into your field of view next turn instead it's like if you have time units left over when the turn is over your character will use those accordingly to take shots so you don't have to click it they just do it automatically if there's enough time left over and so we're going to end turn so you click down here um next to the hourglass to end the turn because that's what they want us to do and once we end the turn then the enemies get to go and we're done with all of our people now you can see we actually have more soldiers um in the top center of the heads up display is like a quick view of all of our soldiers um and you can get change between them by pushing the number keys one through however many you have up at the top like we have seven right now you can see the weapon type that they're using the red bar is their health and the green bar are their time units but right now we're only controlling this first soldier because it's the tutorial so we say end turn now the rest of the soldiers come in 
they're just moving automatically to their positions. This is all scripted so that they can teach us the game, so don't worry about anything that happens here. All right, here come the baddies. Now, these are the cleaners. Attacking enemies. Hover your mouse over the highlighted enemy to bring up your attack cursor. So let's talk about a few things that have happened. Number one, I have this option on which shows their health above their head. Uh, you can put that on or off depending if um, you know that information and you want that information. Also, just like in XCOM in the bottom center of the HUD, you'll see that there are these little alien skull units which show you how many enemies are on the screen that are visible. For the character selected, this guy right here, Peter, all of the aliens that are red, these icons that are red means I can actually see them. And then if it's orange um, or yellow, it indicates that we've been, we have seen them with somebody, like I can see them on the map, but this particular person doesn't have a line of sight to that target. So right now they're saying, if I mouse over this guy, the green number on the left indicates the time units that it will cost me to take this shot, and the white number indicates the percentage chance that we will hit. So, first of all, you know, this game is telling you the percent chance to hit, but even though it's 85, we can still miss, just like XCOM, where you have 99% and you miss, and it's really frustrating, but that's, you know, the breaks. You roll, and maybe you hit, maybe you don't. But in my estimation, as I've played the game so far, these numbers are accurate. They're giving you the actual breakdown of what it takes to hit this enemy, and there aren't hidden factors that are changing this to be something else behind the scenes. So you can usually rely on this information now. If you know more than that, uh, please share that, but that's what I'm understanding so far about the game. Another thing that's super helpful is in the bottom right corner of the heads-up display, you'll see when you mouse over, it says 85% chance to hit, but then it tells you this soldier has a 60 accuracy. They're getting 1.2 times that because of the shot accuracy that we're taking because it's an aimed shot. And then we're getting a 13% bonus because they are in optimal range. So you can see all of the pluses, minuses, multipliers that are determining that 85% chance to hit in the bottom right to help you make a better determination like whoa i'm too far away or this object is blocking or i should do a different shot so i'm just going to click on them and you see we hit them for 30 damage you scored a hit and inflicted 30 damage weapons will inflict between 50 and 200 percent of their damage value with each hit depending on the part of the body hit your soldier has enough time units to attack again so fire a second shot so even though um you don't really know how much damage you're going to do because it's variable. Now, you can look at your weapon if you mouse over it. The ballistic rifle, it says damage 40 kinetic. So you're going to do 50% to 200%. So we actually did less than this. We must have hit them, you know, um, in the arm or something. Just not done full damage. But we could even do, you know, triple the damage. Like if we hit them in the head or something like that. Heads up, these are cleaner units, and when you see this type of unit in the game, at least in my experience, these are uh, usually very tough foes. At least early game. All right, I'm going to shoot them again. Down they went. Next soldier, well done. You successfully killed an enemy. As your soldier does not have enough time units remaining to perform any further attacks, we'll select the next soldier. Press space to mark your current soldier inactive and automatically select the next closest active soldier. Now, let me explain something about this too. You see that we fired from crouching. So our person, Peter, was like behind the cover and stayed behind the cover. And we have four time units, we could stand up, but instead let's just stay hidden. Now you could push space bar to say, don't cycle back to Peter when I'm cycling through my units again because I'm marking him as inactive. But you can always manually click on them or click on this icon in the top center or push one to get back to them even if you've marked them as inactive to use them again. Um, but you can also push tab to switch between your soldiers and not mark them as inactive so that you can cycle back to them. But right now they want us to push space so I will do that. Weapon range, hover over the highlighted enemy. 
The squares drawn between the shooter and the target represent the shot path. The path is green, where the weapon is within range, but the path turns orange, where the weapon is beyond its maximum firing range. Weapons have a lower hit chance and inflict reduced damage when attacking beyond maximum range. And this is super important. It's harder to hit, you do less damage. Especially with something like a shotgun, you want to be up close. So we see that we're only at 42% chance to take this aimed shot, whereas the other guy was at 85% chance. So I'll try to take the shot. And we missed. And we need to go to the next soldier. Although we could take another shot and have 77% chance to hit this one, for example, because they are not at maximum range. They're not beyond maximum range, but the tutorial wants us to switch to somebody else. And it says short range weapons. This soldier is armed with a shotgun, which is much more effective at close range. Move the soldier to the highlighted tile. So I'm going to rotate the map and we can just click right here to move to this tile. And she'll jump over this automatically and kind of go over here. Fire modes. Most weapons have several fire modes with varying accuracy and time unit costs. The most expensive fire mode is selected by default when targeting an enemy as more expensive fire modes provide more accuracy per time unit spent. However, at this range, it would be preferable to fire two shots at lower accuracy due to the passive short range hit chance bonus on this weapon. Hover over the target and use right click to change to the cheaper fire mode and then attack the target. So you can just right click and it doesn't like some games right click is what you do to confirm the action. In this case, we're just toggling between and you can see now we have uh, the ballistic shotgun snapshot selected. And this is part of the game, which is the decision making on what type of fire you want to do. Do you want to do a burst shot? Do you want to do an aim shot? Do you want to do several small shots and just keep rolling to hit? So in this case, the snapshot is better. We have a 61% chance three times because this is a shotgun. So it fires like three projectiles in this game. And if I click on this, um, we missed. Although the shot had a high hit chance, you still missed. Bad luck will happen in this game. And part of the challenge is learning how to best mitigate it when it does occur. And so they're telling you, like, you are not going to hit every time. And it is going to frustrate you and make you sad. And just like me, or I mean, let me just speak for myself. I get salty and frustrated when I miss and they hit. But that's just part of the game. And so, say la vie. However, we get to fire again, which is why we took these shots. So let's fire again. And then that time, oh my gosh, we annihilated them. So we didn't have any more bad luck. So we're going to switch to the next soldier. And they're going to explain cover. Hover over the highlighted enemy. This shot has a low hit chance because there is an intervening cover object, those uh, crates in the shot path. Full details of how the hit chance is calculated is shown at the bottom right of the screen, which I told you about before. In this case, the crates are reducing it by 60%, which is terrible. Only the highest intervening cover value is used to reduce hit chance, and any cover or crouched units adjacent to the shooter are always ignored. So that means like you can fire from behind cover and it doesn't block you, or you can fire over a crouched ally and it doesn't block you. Proceed. Most terrain in Xenonauts 2 is destructible, which is one of the really fun parts about this game. Select the highlighted soldier by clicking on them. And free fire mode allows you to target anything they want. In this case, we can use it to destroy the crates. So you can hold control to shoot at anything. And then we're going to just shoot these crates. So this person just used their shotgun to blow up the crate. So now we can switch back to this soldier and we have an 81% chance to hit with her sniper rifle aimed shot. So Corporal Sarah Smith is going to take the shot, cap, and they're gone. Grenades can be effective at inflicting damage and removing cover in an area. Click the button for the demolition charge to select it as the active weapon. All right, so we're going to do this. So this is something that threw me when I first started playing. When I saw demolition charge, I kind of always took this to be like, you need to place this and then you remotely detonate it or you put a timer on it or something like that. But even though this is like a satchel charge, like it's a, de it's a demolition charge, you can throw it like a grenade. So just be aware of that. All right, so we are going to click on this. And now you can see that we can throw this and it does a three by three area of explosion. If we hit it, if we throw it right here, 
we actually are going to hit both of these cleaners. And it's a 100% chance to hit that. So this is very easy. So we're going to throw this. And it blew up all their cover and damaged them. Your soldier lacks sufficient time units to fire their main weapon, but the second, uh, the pistol in their secondary slot can be fired. So you see how some soldiers have two weapons. Like this person has a ballistic machine gun, which is an awesome heavy weapon, but it's slow. It takes a lot of time units. So if I select their pistol and fire, then I have a chance to hit and finish the job. And he actually can fire again. Alexander can and bam I mean that guy just did good work and now we're going to go to the next soldier and this is a uh, shot preview which is one of my favorite parts of the game our final soldier has a decision to make their shotguns relatively inaccurate at this range and the target is behind heavy cover closing the distance and flanking the target might be beneficial using a shot preview mode will allow us to make a decision about whether this would be worthwhile so what you can do is you can click on this, like they say, shot preview will show you the hit chance and time unit cost for taking a shot from the end of the currently displayed move path. To see the values, hover over the, uh, the targeted enemy, and then you push shift and it changes it. So like right now, if I'm hovering over them, it's telling me what my chances are to hit them from where I'm standing. But if I hold shift, you see how I go from 20% to 93%. And it's going to take 54 time units. Now look at my character in the bottom center of the heads up display. You see that it says six time units. This is going to tell you um, this action is going to take 54 time units to move and fire. And he will have six time units remaining when he's done. If I fired from here, I'd have 36 time units remaining. But we're going to do this and we're going to hold shift on and this guy and then... Um, you, while shot preview mode is active because we've got shift down I'll just left click on that guy and you'll see we'll just move and we're going to shoot and it's absolutely done press end turn to um, proceed in the tutorial you can't push enter to end the turn which you can during the regular game you have to actually click end turn alright so we ended the turn and oh my goodness look, these trucks these are cleaner trucks usually they're, they've got reinforcements and there's way too many of them so fall back to the next room now it's time to make a strategic retreat overwatch fire order the selected soldier to move to the highlighted tile so alex shotgun expert is going to go over here and wait a minute oh my god alex is gone your soldier has just been killed by enemy overwatch fire if a unit ends its turn with enough time units remaining to fire its weapon it may then perform overwatch fire during the enemy turn Suppressing an enemy will prevent overwatch fire, and flashbangs are a good way to generate suppression. Select the flashbang and throw it at the highlighted tile. So suppression is awesome. You can get it by firing at the enemy in some cases with certain weapons or certain conditions, or you could use the flashbang like we're going to do right here. Keep an eye on the enemy, like how many time units that they've used, because if the enemy moves very little, you know that they have some time units left to overwatch fire you. But if it looks like they've run for a long way, like you could see them maybe, then you can kind of guesstimate. I don't even think they have enough time units to take a shot so I can run in front of them safely. It's just something that you have to kind of figure out with the information that you have available. And Overwatch can happen in a few ways where sometimes the enemy won't see you and the line of sight is required for Overwatch and you take a shot at them. But the shot, like you hit them or even if you miss them, it will alert the enemy, they will turn to face you, and then if they have time, they will actually take an overwatch shot at you. And so I've had turns where, like, um, I have come out, shot the enemy, they've overwatched to fire me, and then sometimes you have a back and forth where it's like, I, the enemy comes into my field of vision. I take overwatch fire at them, hit them. They take a shot at me, and then my character actually still had enough time, and they take another Overwatch shot. So it can go back and forth, depending on how many time units are left, what the conditions are, but it's kind of an interesting interaction. So in this case, we're going to use this, and they want us to throw it right here. Bam. All these enemies have been suppressed. Suppression immediately removes all time units from the selected unit, which prevents them from being able to overwatch fire because they have no time. Suppressed units will also only receive 50% of their normal time units the following turn, so it's awesome. 
to kind of stun them like that and we're going to say proceed but you can notice if an enemy has been suppressed or you have this icon occurs this kind of like down red arrow that means suppressed an alternative way to avoid losing soldiers is to make them harder to hit each tile of smoke reduces the hit chance of any shot passing through it so smoke grenades are an excellent way to protect your soldiers so they're telling us about smoke grenades as another utility weapon we're going to fire this right here bam Good work. All the enemies are either out of time units, suppressed, or screened by smoke. Move your soldier to the highlighted tile to complete the tutorial. Now, what's awesome about smoke is you can also see that it did some stun damage. Smoke can, like, incapacitate enemies. If they breathe too much smoke, they can just fall unconscious. And this happens to you as well. So, for example, this soldier that I have, number six, you can see very small... Um, and it's on her health bar as well. There's a little yellow bar running beneath her red health bar. That's her stun value. If that yellow bar ever exceeds her hit point, her current hit point value, she will fall unconscious. So that's how you can, like, you know, um, knock out enemies and do live capture of enemies and things like that uh, with smoke grenades. But right now, we can just go ahead and move. So we're going to move this unit over here to try to get behind the cover. Regroup at the next position, he says. We need to hold them off until the excavation, or the evacuation is complete, rather. All right, and now we've completed the tutorial and we're ready to take on the alien invaders in a full campaign. So that's it. We're gonna just get out of here and RIP that amazing soldier as we complete the mission. Ah, Commander. Good of you to finally make an appearance. Apologies for the delay. This place isn't exactly easy to find. Yes, I believe that's rather the point. Commander, glad to see you made it. Welcome to our backup facility. I had a command room and a cache of emergency supplies installed a while back. No getting around the fact that our new home is a derelict nuclear bunker full of 60s era junk, though. Hope you're fine with cold showers, cold food, and, well, cold everything. You don't last long in the military if you're not. What's our status regarding the cleaners? Relocating bought us some time, but they're still after us. If we don't find a way to eliminate them soon, they'll find us and start attacking here too. But they're not even our biggest problem. Indeed. My recent studies suggest once estimated mass is factored in, extraterrestrial activity appears to follow a mathematically predictable pattern. More precisely, exponential growth and we're nearing the end of the curve in plain english sigh the ufos arriving in our skies will soon begin to increase rapidly in size and or quantity i doubt it will be long until the aliens launch a full-blown invasion i don't like the sound of that how long do we have weeks a couple months at most i suggest you make the most of it okay so now they want us to place our base so we had a temporary facility, now it's time to place our real facility. And when I was joking around, uh, when I first played the game in Alpha, I put my base in Madagascar just because I like Madagascar, uh, but I was quickly told by everyone that this was ridiculous because you want to be able to shoot the UFOs down in a place that is over the land so that you can investigate the crash sites because like you know first of all there's just not very many cities here to even protect and if you did shoot them down over the ocean you lose it so you want to put yourself you know in a place like the middle of you know south america or in north america or you can go in europe or africa or asia somewhere you know so that you are focusing on even australia you know if you want to protect Australia you can you could certainly attempt that I put my base in my let's play and on stream like right here in northern Africa to try to get as much ground as possible uh, and for this one let's go ahead and put it you know right here on the west coast ish ah, that's a lot of ocean um, I guess I should I'm, I'm trying to like get Alaska but maybe I should put it more central in uh, the, the U.S. here in North America to get Canada. 
and yeah, we can just go like right there. And we'll just call this um, tutorial base one and accept that. And now we have a invasion analysis, which is explaining to us that the covert stage of the invasion is coming to an end. And so it's going to become much more military in organization and we're going to have all sorts of problems. Now, you can read this on your own as you're playing the game. Um, I'm just telling you, so I can fast forward to some more information, that I want to show you the, the base and everything. You can read that or pause the screen, but it's basically like, hey, uh, they're ramping up. There's going to be more UFOs. There's going to be more tactical operations to deal with. So the commander is now in charge. That's us. So now they're telling us that they want us to research something, combat vehicles, and I recommend, yes, this is the only thing that we can research to start, and notice in the top center of the heads-up display, we are in the research screen. So this uh, microscope indicates the research screen, you get to deal with this incredibly friendly and fun individual, and he researches stuff for you, and combat vehicles are my favorite thing, you get the Mars which is like this rocket launching robot unit that goes with you and it is vital in my experience and experience to have when you're going on missions especially early on because they pack a, a huge amount of firepower they have a lot of hit points um and if they die you don't lose you know all of the experience for soldiers so we're just going to research this right away and when i click research we're at 125 percent research speed and it's going to take five days of time for this to complete now let's look at some other things that we can do here we can click main base and go to the base overview and you can see right here that this is what we've got this is exactly like xcom one's base builder it's just these squares and you need to connect things and build things we have a hangar for our skyhawk and for our angels we have a radar uh, we have these generators to provide power we have an access lift or an elevator we've got some storerooms we've got the living quarters for the crew we've got the research lab we've got the engineering workshop but what we don't have is a training facility you'll see that our training capacity um, they're not going to be able to train effectively so we immediately need to build um, a training uh, room so I'm going to click and I'm going to say okay let's build something here and what can we build I'm going to click over here on the right so we could build another hangar to allow us to have another aircraft if we want this is expensive um, to not only build the hangar but to buy an aircraft I'm not going to do this we don't need more storage capacity at the moment our power is fine at the moment that we've got right here and our radar is reasonable i think what i really want is a training center now a medical center actually would help us uh to heal our soldiers faster so you could go with that or you could go with a missile battery for defense but i thought i want the training center so i'm going to say build it and this will give us plus 12 training capacity and i'm going to put it right there and it's going to take 20 days so now we've got something building at our base let's check out engineering and all we can make right now is defender armor but we already have four units of this so i don't think we actually need too many but i will make um i'll start production and i'll make one set of defender armor it costs ten thousand, and it'll take 12 hours we could check our soldiers that are right here you can see all of their stats and you can see if they're on the skyhawk or not and you could check in your base doors that we just have those four defender armors and i'm just kind of toggling through the different options on the uh, upper center part of the heads up display by the way you can also see our base right here and this is telling you what is in each square of your base green means the building is complete yellow means the building is under construction and gray means these are all available squares for us to build in now, another thing that I want to show you, this is where you can change your loadout, but of course you can do this um, before each mission, but you can also like create different loadouts like, hey, I want to make this person not a shield unit, although I love a shield unit uh, for just running as the first unit to provide defense. 
but when you go to the aircraft you can this is really cool because you can select the different aircraft that you have and you can actually rename them all this but if you choose the skyhawk you can change where your units are deployed so right now they're all right here but like let's say i go to um my sniper right here who is number nine maybe i want to put the sniper right by the doorway so if anybody is within line of sight of the door the sniper can just fire immediately i also might want to put one rifle person number seven by this door as well and we've got our shield in the front but i want to put my heavy actually up in the front as well the assault people have shotguns because these weapons you need to be in close range or the heavy it takes a lot of units for her to move places so i'd rather have her be closer to the front and you can customize your loadout of where units are on your skyhawk and then at that point you can look into xenopedia to read all of the messages that you just saw like this one that i skipped through and get more tips and and now all you need to do is come here and wait for something to happen. Just speed time up and wait for your research to finish, wait for your engineering project to construct, wait for the training facility to be built at the base, and wait for a UFO or some other crash site to emerge for us to interact with. And I think this is a great place to end the first episode of this complete beginner's guide to Xenonauts 2. We're going to get into more stuff. I'll show you more of the content, but this is a great place for you to see, okay, what happens in the battle? How do I play the game? What are some tips and tricks? How do I understand everything that's going on with the interface? And as we go further, we'll get to make decisions about raiding bases, defending against UFOs, doing more research, and everything involving Xenonauts 2 in early access. If you have any questions, please post those in the comments below. And if you've got any tips that you'd like to share that are beginner friendly, that would be amazing. Everyone, thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this to be useful. Take care.